Uh, this is also going to be a somewhat, uh, in fact, uh, almost entirely non-technical talk. Um, and um, I, uh, I think that I'm going to focus really on the, on the policy issues. This, is a, this has turned out to be a rather controversial topic, um, as you can well imagine. So um, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, the, 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 the real uh, oars behind this effort are uh, my graduate student, Adam Cataldo, and my colleague, Shankar Sastri, who have uh, put a lot of effort into it, as well as me. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you a little bit about what, uh, what this softball's idea is about, but then I'm going to focus on, the, on some of the objections that people have raised, which are, which are numerous and interesting and intricate, um, and then just give you a brief sense of what the current research is in this area. Um, so this project actually started on September 11th of 2001 uh, when I was um, um, sitting at home trying to figure out what I was going to say to my class of 220 uh, undergraduate students on the next day. Uh, the particular class that I was teaching is an introductory signals and systems class with kind of a computational slant and it talks a lot about embedded software systems and about control systems. and. Um, I knew that I couldn't go in on September 12th and give you know, the same old lecture that I would have given uh, had those events not occurred. And so in the process of trying to puzzle through what to say, I decided that I was going to talk about the control systems in aircraft and um, started to think about, well, what could, what could be changed in the control systems in aircraft to um, uh, prevent events like what happened on September 11th. And uh, the, the idea is really a pretty obvious idea. And I, you know, I, after, after I started talking about it, which was uh, first on September 12th, um, uh, I've been approached by a lot of people who have also independently thought of the idea. There's a few people who have even tried to patent variants of, of it since then. Um, so it's really pretty obvious in retrospect, but it certainly wouldn't have occurred to me before September 11th. Um, the idea is very simple. The idea is that uh, an aircraft control system carries on board uh, a three-dimensional database of the planet uh, that uh, includes information in it about where the aircraft should not be flying. Now, obvious areas that it should not be flying uh, are areas where uh, there is terrain. The aircraft are not too good at flying through uh, matter that is more dense than air. Um, and so you want to keep them out of mountains and things like that, so you certainly include that. But in addition, uh, you can include in that database uh, uh, critical infrastructure areas, uh, uh, regions around nuclear power plants, regions around densely populated cities, and so on. Now, the, the notion is to enforce these no-fly zones entirely using onboard avionics, the onboard electronics of the control system. So in other words, you don't want to do this through some network system that requires communication with the ground. Um, instead, you'd like it to be as, as self-contained a system as possible so that the aircraft itself essentially refuses to fly into these no-fly zones. Um, this idea is obviously applicable uh, to commercial aircraft. Uh, perhaps a little more interestingly, uh, with a really long-term vision, my colleague Shankar Sastri has been pushing this notion of personal aircraft, and, uh, and there's also, of course, been a lot of interest in unmanned air vehicles. And there's a lot of people who feel like these, these sorts of uh, flying vehicles are not going to be very prevalent until there is a technology like this on them that will, uh, that will keep them out of inhabited regions, for example. Um, the, the concept is, is fairly real, and in fact, I'd like to just uh, uh, highlight two uh, prototypes of the system that have been uh, demonstrated already, one of them on UAVs uh, by Claire Tomlin's group at Stanford, uh, using, in fact, that, uh, that, that vehicle right there. And uh, there, I w there is a video of this that uh, is actually not very, a very exciting video, but it's just, in, it's just there to to show you that it's, that it's real and that you can uh, keep these uh, UAVs out of these no-fly zones. Now, the key idea here is that, of course, a UAV is entirely controlled by the onboard electronics anyway, and the, and, but the design of this system superimposes a separate control system that keeps it out of the no-fly zones. And this separation of the control systems is part of the way that you guarantee the safety of the system. Um, oh, okay. Uh, Honeywell who makes, uh, Honeywell makes a, a system that has been deployed on quite a number of aircraft uh, called, called a uh, uh, enhanced uh, ground avoidance system, um, which as it's deployed currently is an advisory system. So that when aircraft that are equipped with this uh, approach terrain inappropriately, i.e. they're not in the vicinity of an airport, for example, uh, they get a warning in the cockpit that tells them that they're approaching terrain. It uses a similar technology. There's an onboard database 
uh, that knows where this terrain is. Uh, Honeywell has recently, in fact, last fall, adapted uh, that system to create a simple version of, uh, of the soft walls uh, mechanism where if the pilot ignores these warnings, then the uh, control system actually takes over at the autopilot level and flies the aircraft away from, uh, from the no-fly zone. And they demonstrated this actually on national TV on ABC World News Tonight uh, with Peter Jennings on December 30th. You could, uh, the, there was a Honeywell pilot right here uh, with his hands off because he was trying to fly this aircraft into a mountain and it wouldn't go. Um, now, both of these prototypes use fully autonomous control. So the basic approach that they take is that uh, the, the aircraft uh, uh, mechanisms take input from normally from a pilot or a path planning controller in the case of a UAV. Um, and in both of these prototypes, when uh, an incursion into a no-fly zone is detected, the control system would simply switch over to a fully automatic control that would uh, fly the aircraft away from the no-fly zone before turning over control back to the other control system. Um, we think that this is good for an early prototype, but this really isn't the ultimately, ultimately the best approach. So the approach that we're taking is trying to give, uh, it's, it's following the principle of trying to give the pilot uh, of an aircraft as much authority over the aircraft as is consistent with keeping that aircraft out of the no-fly zones. So the approach that we're taking will actually blend uh, a soft walls control with a pilot control when the aircraft, uh, when an incursion into a no-fly zone is detected. So that blending leaves the pilot with fine grain control, okay? Um, so the principle here is that uh, we want to maximize pilot authority, uh, but keep the aircraft out of forbidden airspace. Um, so the basic mechanism that this works, uh, the, the way that this works is that as, as an aircraft approaches a uh, no-fly zone, if the pilot simply remains neutral and holds the, holds the controls uh, steady headed towards the no-fly zone, then a, a bias uh, gets added to the control that will deviate the aircraft away. Now, and a, uh, a cooperative pilot will, of course, uh, be made aware that, that there is a, a, uh, an area that, that is being approached that, uh, that the aircraft is not supposed to be in and will turn away from the no-fly zone, and he still has that fine-grained control to be able to do that. An uncooperative pilot will try to counter the system and fly into the no-fly zone, and that will, the, the system will simply react by increasing the bias adequately until it, the, eventually the, the bias will saturate the controls and the pilot will not be able to enter the no-fly zones. Um, so this concept is really pretty simple, but it's gotten a lot of, uh, uh, of media attention, more than, uh, more than technical attention, actually. It seems to have captured the imagination of, of quite a few people. Uh, ABC uh, uh, broadcast a segment on uh, just this last December 30th uh, where they showed this uh, rather nice graphic of an aircraft uh, approaching a city protected by this virtual uh, space. And uh, there I am on ABC News. Uh, the principal reaction I've gotten from my colleagues who saw this was that they didn't know that I owned a necktie. Um, but <laughs> so I'd like to turn my attention to talking about what the objections are to this system. I'd, I'd be willing to bet that at least three quarters of the room is thinking to themselves right now, this is a really stupid idea. And uh, here's, here's a bunch of the reasons that, uh, that have been given. Reducing pilot control is dangerous. It reduces the ability to respond to emergencies. Um, this is in fact true. And in, in fact, uh, pilots, uh, you have to recognize that pilots come from a 2,000 year old tradition of the ship's captain. And the ship's captain is responsible for, uh, ultimately, for the safety of the, the passengers, uh, the vessel, and the crew. And um, this tradition is, is a long-standing thing that is, it creates a culture among pilots that resists any reduction in authority. And it's an appropriate uh, resistance, I believe. Uh, in fact, it, the, the issue is that the pilot has a tremendous amount of responsibility, and responsibility without authority is a terrible thing. I mean, just, just ask a, a typical department chairman, um, and you'll see that, you know, where, where the problem is. Um, so this is a totally understandable position. However, it's clear that there are regions of airspace in, in to, into which there is simply no justification for an aircraft to enter. Um, it may be theoretically possible to safely land an aircraft on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan. It is obviously absurd to permit that. Um, it's simply too dangerous, okay? No emergency on board an aircraft would justify that. Now, 
the fact that there exist such regions of airspace um, is, is not a very consoling thing to the pilots, however, because uh, one of the things I think that they fear is that if, if a system like this is established, then regulatory agencies get to define the no-fly zones, and they may get overzealous and, and, and eventually create just tunnels in the sky. Uh, that the aircraft can fly through and greatly limit the actual navigable airspace, which of course limits uh, tremendously the ability that pilots have to respond to emergencies. So some uh, regulatory restraint would be required uh, in order to not uh, over-constrain the airspace. I'd like to point out that um, to some degree uh, the airspace is already more constrained than, than people realize. Uh, the current defenses around Washington, D.C., uh, rely ultimately on anti-aircraft missiles. Here's a picture from the New York Times just a few days ago that shows um, anti-aircraft missiles on top of the new executive building across, from, uh, across the street from the White House. Um, these are the ultimate line of defense for keeping aircraft out of no-fly zones in, in Washington, D.C. And um, I've, it, th there was actually an article in the New York Times about a year earlier uh, about, about this system which uh, ta uh, talked, uh, interviewed a pilot who had, in fact, encountered a, a uh, micro weather burst in an approach to National Airport and had ended up flying over uh, the White House. I would fear that in a situation like that today that these anti-aircraft missiles would be used, and I think that's a very dangerous situation. Um, pilots uh, have uh, uh, also a, an expectation that virtually all of the technology uh, in the cockpit uh, can be overridden. Uh, at least they think that. I mean, uh, it's obviously not true. You can't, you can't uh, override the need for wings to keep the aircraft up, for example. Um, but nonetheless, they expect to be able to turn technology off. In fact, the, the hijackers on September 11th turned off the transponders uh, in the aircraft. There's an on-off switch for the transponders uh, accessible to the pilot uh, uh, immediately in the cockpit. Why the pilots have that control over the transponder is beyond me, but nonetheless, I, I, they do have that control, and um, pilots expect to be able to uh, turn off this system when uh, some malfunction occurs. And I guess that uh, my general reaction to this is that wh what we're talking about is creating regions of three-dimensional space into which the aircraft won't fly. That by itself is actually not a new concept. Here's a region of three-dimensional space into which the aircraft won't fly. Um, the, we're talking about creating regions where the enforcement is a little bit gentler. Uh, than for this one, that's all. Um, one of the problems with this technology is that it relies on localization. So the aircraft uh, avionics has to know exactly uh, or with reasonable precision where the aircraft is and localization technology can fail. Uh, in particular, GPS, which is heavily used in navigation in aircraft today, is very easy to jam. Uh, I think someone could easily board an aircraft with a very small piece of electronics that would disable the GPS system on the aircraft which would uh, um, limit the ability of the aircraft to know where it is. Um, of course, aircraft are equipped with uh, backup systems. Radio beacons are, are still in use around, uh, around airports, uh, but ultimately inertial navigation, which has uh, been around and is a really quite a mature technology, um, is used uh, when you have a known starting point location. Uh, the inertial navigation systems with remarkably low drift can measure the, the position of the aircraft over time. Uh, this is a picture of an inertial navigation system at, that is uh, typical of one that is installed in commercial aircraft today. Um, now, the fact that these inertial navigation systems drift create an interesting technical problem. First, you, you have to be sure that you can detect that the GPS system has failed. Right? In other words, it, 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 it's essential that it not be possible to spoof the GPS system. In other words, create a signal in which you, you fool the GPS system into thinking that the aircraft is somewhere that it's not. Okay? Uh, that is technically possible. You can prevent spoofing of the GPS system. Uh, the second thing is that if you can detect uh, that the GPS system reliably, that the GPS system is malfunctioning, uh, then you can uh, switch over to the inertial navigation system, but over time that will drift, and the amount that it drifts will limit the geometries of the no-fly zones around airports. All right, so that's a, that's a technical issue. It's an addressable technical issue. I'm not going to go into the details, but it's one of the technical issues that is involved in this research project. Um, a, a very major objection is that uh, deployment of such a system could be costly. Uh, this is a very real objection. This would, be, this would be an extremely expensive thing if it were done in such a way 
that it was mandated uh, that all aircraft, all commercial aircraft were equipped with such a system. Uh, in particular, retrofitting older aircraft appears to be a very expensive thing to do. However, a newer aircraft, um, it is literally a software change. Okay, on fly-by-wire aircraft, uh, particularly if it's designed from the beginning into the aircraft, uh, there's no intrinsic reason why it should significantly increase the cost of the design or manufacture of those aircraft. So for the truly long term, uh, the, the cost of deployment is, is, is actually not very high. Uh, but the cost of retrofitting aircraft is substantial. And, and even with fly-by-wire aircraft, um, which are aircraft where the control system is entirely controlled by software today, uh, even with such aircraft, um, retrofitting them is, is costly because of the valid certification requirements on that software. Making changes, people at Boeing tell me that um, for the life of the 777, which is a fly-by-wire aircraft, they will probably not change a line of software in that, in that aircraft because the certification costs for recertifying that software after changing a line of software is much higher than the certification costs for substituting some piece of hardware. Uh, interestingly enough. So the, the, the software becomes more rigid than the hardware in these fly-by-wire aircraft. Um, in in uh, older aircraft, there are mechanical and hydraulic linkages between the pilot and the control surfaces of the aircraft. So the pilot is able to, in fact, uh, use these mechanical and, and hydraulic linkages to affect uh, the trajectory of the aircraft. Uh, that complicates uh, an, an, a deployment of a system like softwalls. A very simple scheme is to deploy it at the level of an autopilot system, which is what Honeywell did in their, pro in their prototype. That basically shuts out the pilot. It doesn't do the blending control that ultimately we're after. So the pilot is, lo is left without any authority at all uh, for some period of time. Um, we would like to find a way where blending control could be used on these older aircraft, but we're not exactly sure how to do that. Um, the complexity issue, the software certification problem is a significant one. Um, fortunately, this system is actually not that complex. Um, the, the software, it's nothing like uh, what's involved, for example, in, in, in air traffic control systems where certification issues are, are a, a really major barrier to um, uh, uh, significant overhaul uh, of those systems. There are human factors issues. There are questions about whether uh, pilot training, uh, what sort of pilot training is required to adapt to this system. Uh, whether there's air traffic controller training that's required to adapt to a system like this. Those kinds of issues need to be addressed. Um, another objection that gets raised is, why would you want to do this since fully automatic control is possible? We know how to fly uh, vehicles with no pilot on board. Why couldn't we just uh, detect an incursion, throw a switch, and control the aircraft from the ground? All right, there have been a number of proposals for doing that, but there's a number of potential problems with ground control. One is there's a human-in-the-loop delay, so you need authorization for takeover, and there might be some delay in recognizing the threat. Uh, a second one is that it creates a security problem on the ground. It creates a potential for hijacking from the ground, or even in, in a worst case scenario, take, taking over of an entire fleet uh, from, the, from the ground. And also it requires radio communication, which uh, introduces its own, its own additional vulnerabilities. So whereas it's technically feasible to do this uh, uh, control from the ground, it's a much more complex problem. Now, flight envelope protection is, uh, is, is a technology that is used in certain commercial aircraft and a lot of military aircraft, where essentially in a fly-by-wire aircraft, when the pilot issues a command, the computer on board the aircraft decides whether or not executing that command is safe. For example, will it take the, will it take the plane into a stall or something like that? And the computer will limit the pilot actions to keep the aircraft from going into an unsafe state. Uh, this kind of a technology is used in, in uh, virtually all of the uh, Airbus aircraft that have been designed since the mid-1980s. Uh, so th since, the, since the A320, um, all of the Airbus aircraft have flight envelope protection. Uh, Airbus and Boeing, interestingly enough, have a, have a very uh, vocal disagreement about the, about the value of, of, of these uh, flight envelope protection systems, and Boeing has not deployed them on any commercial aircraft. The 777, which is a fly-by-wire aircraft, does not have uh, flight envelope protection, so, it is, so the pilot is, in fact, able to issue commands that will take that aircraft into a stall. Um, it turns out that, uh, that deploying a softwall system on an aircraft without flight envelope protection is considerably more complicated than it is on an aircraft with flight envelope protection. In effect, the softwall system, in certain circumstances, has to implement the flight envelope protection in addition to the, 
uh, restriction of the airspace um, for, for, I think, obvious reasons. Otherwise, it would be possible, for example, for uh, a pilot to take a plane over a no-fly zone and put it into a stall. So um, the research questions are interesting ones. Provable robust blending control algorithms. I think that the, the fully automatic control uh, is, is a relatively straightforward thing. The blending control problem is a little bit more interesting, and uh, it's the one that we've really focused on. In particular, we need techniques that are, that are, that are absolutely bulletproof, um, where we can, really be, we can really be quite sure about the algorithms. Uh, if we can't be sure about the algorithms, we're certainly not going to be sure about the software. But of course, being sure about the software is another interesting research question. Methods for validating the software are a key issue. Um, the techniques have to be scalable to a planetary database. You've got to be able to cut, carry enough information on the aircraft to, to protect all of the no-fly zones get, that get defined. Um, an interesting research question is how could one allow dynamically defined no-fly zones? So for example, could you create a no-fly zone uh, around the Air Force One as it's moving through airspace? Um, that's, uh, that's a more challenging problem because it, it, re it requires dynamic updates to the database. And of course, the application to fly-by-wire aircraft is technically simpler than to other aircraft, but uh, nonetheless, it, it, interesting issues uh, that uh, are involved. So I'm gonna, I'm, I think I'm going to not talk so much about the, the I was gonna briefly mention what uh, the control algorithms that we're looking at are, but I'm gonna skip right over those and uh, go to the conclusions um, and take questions of which I'm sure there, there are many. Um, we think that of this generally as an embedded systems control, uh, an embedded control systems challenge. We've identified the control theory issues uh, that are involved. We've got candidate solutions uh, that we believe are in fact uh, provably robust uh, but have scalability problems. So one of the things that we're work working on is, is uh, variants of those algorithms that don't have those scalability problems. Um, and we have a website that has a frequently asked questions, which uh, has a list of some, uh, I think, 55 or so questions uh, and some discussion of those questions. So if you're interested, you might want to look at the, that website. So. Wouldn't be any legal issues with this system, would there be? Uh, <laughs> um, I'm sure there. I'm, I'm sure there would be. I mean, there are generally with with aircraft control software. I don't think, I don't think the issues here would be any different from what, uh, you know, the issues are with generally with the software in fly by wire aircraft. But yeah. Um, that's that's an interesting question. Uh, it is it, it's certainly it's certainly possible to do. Uh, one of the things that is of concern, for example, is that would it be possible to hack the database? Just replace the database uh, that, that uh, defines the no-fly zone, so that you, for example, uh, define the region around National Airport to be a no-fly zone and the region around the White House to be uh, perfectly okay. Um, I, I think that the the, tech, the technology issues for uh, protecting the database are, are relatively straightforward. I mean, it's, uh, you can simply uh, ensure that the, that the data is digitally signed. Um, there's, a, there's a bunch of more complex issues because there are multiple layers of protection that you need to provide. For example, if you have, if you have a relatively sophisticated uh, uh, perpetrator who's, who's able to replace significant amounts of the control hardware in the aircraft, then there, uh, there, there are additional vulnerabilities that are created. Uh, some of those are addressed in the FAC on this website, so if you're interested, you might want to take a look at that. Well, I was just familiar with some work that was done in the military that was uh, basically they use force feedback joysticks so that if you're going to hostile areas with maybe anti-aircraft fire, uh, you would really have to push a joystick very hard because it's these were areas to avoid. I just wonder if you used any sort of similar algorithm in terms of uh, additive force feedback. Like yeah. Um, there, there are people who have been considering that. In fact, there's a group in the Netherlands that has prototyped a, a system and implemented it on a, on a fairly large scale uh, flight simulator that uses force feedback, and they've been doing subjective analysis of, uh, of the way that pilots interact with it. Um, it's a controversial approach. Uh, in, in the military systems that you talk about, they, they have actually had some crashes that they attribute to the pilots fighting with the force feedback system. And you can well imagine how this would happen. I mean, if you think of yourself arm wrestling with someone, you lose precision in 
in, in control when you're, when you're trying to exert a lot of force. And that loss of precision can create problems in an aircraft. Um, we've been trying to avoid anything that involves force feedback. And we believe that in fly-by-wire aircraft, it's not necessary to use force feedback systems. In older aircraft, there may be, it may well be that force feedback is the best alternative. I'm going to cut the questions in the interest of time, Edward, but this is really very interesting. I encourage people to go to the website, look at the facts, see you afterwards. Thank you very much for a great talk. If I could okay. have that mic back.